Okay, uh, welcome everybody um, to this talk. Uh, as the name says, this talk is about frameworks. Um, um, and hopefully, I mean, frameworks are very important in development nowadays. Uh, just in the previous presentation, you saw that there were a couple of slides just talking about framework, Spring, and whatever. I mean, um, there are, even good people may sometimes have some concerns about frameworks or some complaints about frameworks. They are accepted as a uh, necessary evil because uh, the common uh, sense, common logic says that without frameworks, it will be much more harder to develop. At least it will be difficult to be uh, proficient and efficient development um, as well. Uh, or maybe not. And that's what this uh, presentation, this talk is about. It's obviously a very opinionated uh, presentation because based on my own uh, experience doing this, um, we are working in Java for so more than uh, 10 years and ever use a framework. I try most of them, mostly for curiosity. But then I, I arrived to the same conclusion that using them would be, have been a mistake. Uh, but however, uh, what take me to this uh, presentation, this presentation had an interesting story, is that uh, basically I came to this idea of this presentation because I, in a, in a conference, I realized I get into this same pattern of conversation. Uh, like, oh, you're a Java developer, which framework do you use? Uh, none. It's like, huh? So, <laughs> to, be, to be honest, this not only happens to me, I have a friend who do a Ruby uh, development, and uh, once you say, I'm a Ruby developer, are you Rails? Uh, no, Ruby. Uh, so it's like people assume that you develop, you must use some kind of frameworks to work. And that is not the case. Um, however, uh, this uh, presentation, this talk, uh, hopefully is not simple rant against uh, or the frameworks. Uh, I don't have any personal problem with framework, neither with people use framework. It's more like a, an, an attempt to, to uh, make a, um, an analysis. What are the consequences of using frameworks? And obviously, it's implying the talk itself. I suppose there are some problems. I mean, some of these consequences are undesirable consequences. And what, uh, what we can do to fix uh, these uh, consequences? I mean, which alternative we have? Um, so what's wrong with frameworks? Uh, the main problem with frameworks, the most evident problem with frameworks is what Eric Gamma, and this guy has a lot of things to do about design, called the framework kitties. The framework kitties basically is the DC where the framework is, is like information in the framework. The framework takes uh, too much of your, of your stake in development. Uh, when you find out that the framework is trying to do too much or in a way you don't want, but you cannot avoid the way of the framework. And basically, uh, the consequence of this is that you end up doing a lot of stuff that you, don't, that you didn't intend to do just because you need to do it in order to make the framework work. So I, at, at some point, uh, you start working for the framework. It is not the framework that is working for you anymore. Uh, obviously, it's not going to happen the first day, I and mean, even if you are a good programmer at the beginning, you will start working and you control the framework. But that's a given point, as, and that's something that we will recall. As more junior people come into the project, as the framework becomes part of the culture of the company, of the development team, then you find out in this situation, when you start working for the framework, not the framework working for you. Uh, because it's imposing some limitation. And the main reason is because secondly, every framework wants to be a platform. In the original exception of the term framework, you look at the origin of the framework definition, which is back to 1990 something, I think four or three, uh, a framework was uh, the main difference between uh, a framework was kind of kind, a kind of library with a um, inversion of control. That was a framework. 
a library that instead of you calling it, it calls you back. That is. But nowadays, if you look at Spring, it's anything but a library. You can think of everything, but the library is not a library anymore. Okay? And, and that's the problem of frameworks. It evolves to become complete platforms. And they put in the middle of you and your purpose or your intentions in development. Okay? Um, this this uh, 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 quote is from, from this interesting, uh, I think this is a pointer maybe? I don't know. But this interesting, uh, yeah. oh, sorry, my mistake. Uh, okay. Trying to use the pointer only. Okay, it's not working. It's the pointer. Oh, okay, so basically don't use it. Okay, I got it. Thank you. Okay, sorry. Uh, this is this quote for this uh, uh, article is, is, is uh, how, no, uh, how uh, LinkedIn uh, migrate from uh, Rails to Node.js. And the spirit is a very, very um, controversial article for every single paragraph. There are discussions about it, but it's, it's worth reading. And what basically what they say that the, the final decision to move out of Rails was because of this, because they found they were doing a lot of play that has nothing to do with their intention anymore, but they do, must do it just because they were using Rails. Okay? Now, <coughs> and that's the problem with this is not only that you're doing things that you should and probably shouldn't be doing, the problem is that, as this guy said, uh, uh, um, Eric Hicke, the, the author of closure say is that many of these complicating uh, constructors are completely incidental to your problem. You just start doing, you know, um, a kind of uh, factories like this. Uh, I, I love this uh, strip. And you the, provide, the panel, content provider, the panel can provide the factory, the content can provide the builder, the content provider, whatever. It has nothing to do with your problem. But you are writing this code, and this code is introducing incidental complexity to your software base. So now, to understand your code, I need to understand all this stuff. And this complexity has nothing to do with the real complexity of your problem. You're not any more talking about your problem. Because your problem is not about factories, really. I mean, you have other problems, not factories. So at the end, what happens is that it's very really important is that the code you create with this kind of framework is easy to create, but it's a really complex code because of all this incidental complexity. Um, and as this uh, pretty clear guy said very clearly is that because you stand in the shoulders of giants, I mean, you're using very powerful tool created for more uh, powerful guys, and you know, a brilliant guy has created all this amazing stuff, you can use it for free, and you can do amazing stuff, really complicated stuff, just because you couldn't do it, and you don't know what you're doing. And that is. I mean, I, I, I check it this many times, I, I have never met somebody using, um, uh, for instance, Hibernate, that had a clue of what Hibernate does. I mean, they don't know. They don't know what problem they're solving. They have never tried to do it by hand. Therefore, they don't know what problem Hibernate is solving. Not to mention how he's solving it, <laughs> which is more complicated. But just let's start to try to, what, what Hibernate, what problem Hibernate is. So I, I, one of the biggest discussions I ever had about design uh, was precisely where we should be using Hibernate or not for a project. And I, I mean, this was like, uh, because it's easier. Mm -hmm. But do you know how all the thing that using hybrid brings to your code? Because you are now working in a way that basically is imposed for the hibernate itself, to some extent. I mean, the pattern, the way you work, OK? So and that's another big, big problem is that you can do things that are amazingly complex just because it's easy. That is. Let's try it. But, you know, power should require discipline. 
you should be allowed to do that once you understand what you're doing, not before. And also, uh, at the end, it imposes some restriction in choices. Uh, this guy, um, uh, basically, when he said that when he leaves .NET, um, by the way, .NET is a great framework. I mean, I have very tried a very few, but it's, it's really a very powerful framework for doing stuff. And the runtime is amazing. But this guy basically said it, it leave it because they change the focus for um, safety. I mean, doing the safe thing, what is already provided by the by the platform, by the, by the in this case, not that it's actually a platform, but the framework instead of trying new things. And this also is a problem. You don't, you don't try anything because you already have the problem solved by the framework. So you don't, you don't even consider alternative because they are there. And I think this is the key of this talk is, yes, we need to make a code in an efficient way. We need to uh, make code that all people can maintain. We need to make code that even junior developers can work with. But in that process, we should also increase our collective knowledge. We should learn more. Design is a, is a, is a process of learning. That's something which is important. It's at the end, the project of design, you have to learn nothing. You are not really doing design. You're applying your well-known practices or whatever. You know. It's like planning. It's the same concept. At the end of the planning process, you didn't learn anything about the project, you are not doing planning. Because you're increasing your knowledge of the problem you have in time. Exactly the same happens here. But how did you teach magic? How did you teach the magic of hibernate? It's amazing stuff like the appendix injection. Okay. Um, to Uniprogram. Even supposing you know what it is. Let's, let's suppose you know because you are a senior and you understand. But how do you explain that? How do you explain how dependency works? Is the guy that has no clue what, what he's talking about? How do you explain things that have never experienced? Actually, um, I've been in a long term. Uh, uh, professor in the university, and, and something I always like is to do a problem-based uh, teaching because you cannot give a people, a person, an answer if that person doesn't have a, a question before. It's meaningless. So you are giving the people a lot of answers. They, they don't know what you're talking about because, you know, it's, it's, they don't have a question at all. It, it's much productive if you give them a problem, they have a lot of questions that they will find, either they will find the answer themselves, or even if you help them to find the answers, they will understand because they have a context. Okay? But as soon as you are teaching magic, that you cannot do this anymore. Okay? And the other problem with magic is when it stops working. Because by definition, you will understand magic. So you, you usually get into a very big problem with you don't understand magic. Actually, regarding this, for instance, every time I try something new, I now I'm playing with Go, the first thing I do is uh, download the project, install it, run, as they say, just to be sure this is not broken. And then I erase it and try to do it in a different way. And 95% of the time, it didn't work. It doesn't work because I changed something. And then finally, I'm trying to make it work. And at the end of this process, I learn a lot. Because you will never learn more than breaking stuff. Yeah, guys, what, you, what we do as children, breaking no toy, that's the way. There's no other way. You need to break stuff. If you want to learn, you need to break stuff. Okay, but you cannot make a break magic. You cannot touch that. And now, People were probably thinking, wow, but you're talking about the problem that is supposed to agile development will solve. Well, the, problem, the main issue here is that I'm not talking about the development process itself. I'm talking about the artifact, the software. 
This quote is amazing. This is, this is the author of one of the book I'm, I'm using as a reference from this at all. He said that basically the amount of COVID is increasing at an amazing pace. In the last decade, we basically spent all, most of the time trying to fix the development process, but we forgot about the software. And the conclusion is it's time to go back to this design because at the end of the day, as you said, we said in the previous uh, uh, talk, uh, at the end of the day, you, you need to deliver something. And that something is complex. Now it's 10 times more complex than one decade ago. So we need to do something regarding that. So some hints about the solution. And um, I'm basically using, uh, oh, I'm, no. I'm basically using uh, these two books as a reference because uh, I was preparing this talk with trying to find some material and I found coming back to these guys two or three times, okay, this guy more or less have the same uh, philosophy. There are, I probably don't agree 100%, but who does? Um, but I think that the approach they propose is quite compelling, okay? Uh, I strongly recommend you these two books. Um, the, the hint of the solution is first you need to create a vision of the systems you are working with, or your development, then this is very important. You need to shift the focus on risk. Be, be a really risk-driven process, design process. And then you need to actually know a way, uh, find a way to document the meaningful um, aspect of the design, okay? So the first thing you need is to create your own style. And that's very important in style because style provides a vocabulary for expressing what is relevant in your architecture, okay? Uh, and, and reason about the, 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 the properties. But uh, I will just see what, what exactly style is. I will first give you an example, which is a clear canonical example of what the style is, Unix 5 style. Everybody knows that, okay? They follow a simple rule, you create simple uh, programs that do one thing, and they communicate by means of text streams. And that is. And 35 years later, we are using it. And we, everybody's happy. Okay? Why? Because it works. See, it's, 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 it's something that gives you a lot of hints of how, how the system is being, what's the philosophy behind that. Actually, this has become a philosophy of design, uh, of designing system. Okay? So you can easily uh, transmit this to a new, co a new people in the project. This, our project is like this. The, our philosophy, people will get it quickly. And then you have a vocabulary. And later we, all, we will see that it's important to have a vocabulary for, to express your ideas, okay? Um, however, the problem with styles is that it's not easy to spot them in the wild. Uh, if you want to get really confused about what an architectural style is, you just only have to go to the Wikipedia page about style and we say, what the fuck? I mean, I read it three times and say, hmm? Why? Because it spots things that are uh, styles, like pipes. But they said that all you're going to program in a style. This is not a style, it's a programming paradigm. It's nothing to do with architecture. Because architecture is about the uh, overall uh, structure of your system. You can do whatever you want with, with, uh, with objects. Object-oriented programming doesn't impose you any restriction on how you organize your system. And this is very important. Sorry, I forget to mention this. Uh, this, this vocabulary implies also some restriction of what is licit to do when you compose this element of the architecture, okay? And this is important, restrictions are important. Actually, these restrictions are very important because uh, Garland, one of the father of the modern software architecture movement, they, he said that doing software architecture is, pur is purposefully limiting your design options in exchange of predictable properties. So when you define your style, the style tells what is listed to do and what is not listed to do. So, Object orienting is definitely not a style. And now um, you have message passing and then you have event oriented. 
which one is in style? Uh, I, my personal take is that event is in a, is a, is a style, but message passing is more a communication mechanisms, probably a communication paradigm or whatever, because you can do a lot of stuff with message passing, okay? So actually you can do pies with message passing, you can do uh, events with message passing, so it's like, mm, it's not really restricting the way you organize your system. And then microservices, which is also now a uh, soap, uh, because there is nothing new at the architectural level in service and uh, microservices that weren't in, in SOAP, except the thing that people do wrong. But I mean, that's not so <laughs> for people do it wrong. It's like microservices so do done well. But from the conceptual point of view, from the uh, architectural point of view, from the vocabulary you had, and from the um, restriction you imposed in your design, I will say this basically the same, okay? So uh, one thing that's important if you decide you have a style in your system, be sure it's a style. Be sure that whatever you choose in a style is uh, something that transmits uh, uh, a vocabulary, something that gives you a way to spread fundamental concept of your system that is easy to transmit and important that implies or explicitly said what is listed and what is not. And then the next stuff you, you should do is, is you should document which is relevant and structural part of the system. And this is precisely the part I'm not going into because I think this is a very opinionated uh, topic by itself. What kind of, 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 of uh, diagrams you need, how many of them, uh, how you use it. However, following one of these uh, two uh, books, uh, sorry, uh, the software architecture for developer. This guy proposed what he called, I understood this, this image is from this, uh, uh, his side. He proposed uh, uh, what he calls, he calls the 4C uh, model, which is our uh, context, uh, containers, components, and optionally classes. Uh, context gives you the overall idea of the system, what your system must interact with, which is extremely important, okay? Um, then you define the container. I mean, how do you will deploy the system, the physical architecture, and the container is the logical deployment for. And then he said that for some of these components, which are very complex, a domain, um, uh, a lot of domain complexity, for instance, you probably will need some classes but are needed. So more than C4 should be C3 plus one, because it, the other one is optional. And I really like this idea because it's mostly what we have been doing for, for some years. Actually, it's what I've been doing for, for years. So the key question here is what it means to be relevant. It's like, OK, document only what is relevant. What is that? Well, and then here is what the risk-driven process comes. You basically want to avoid this stuff. That's pure design. Remember, you're not using anymore the uh, uh, wisdom of the framework. You are alone in the dark with your problems at night. And then you need to deliver something. So basically, you don't want to, to uh, and if you are, uh, you have some junior developers in your team, you also have this problem that, that people don't have all the experience doing stuff, so they probably will end up with this some of these minor problems. So it is important that you focus on the architecture on those parts which are more, re bring more risk. What kind of risk? Well, you have basically two sources of risk. The, the one is due to the team or, or, or sorry, three, 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 three sources. One is the, the team itself, or the, the project itself, what you are doing. It is a, a transactional uh, banking system, you have some security risks, or you have some exposure to external violations or whatever. Then you have risk of the team itself. What your team do, knows, what your team doesn't know, what technology you are, have to do, because it's legacy, because you have to do it, your experience, your time, your budget. And then you have technology factor, like what kind of technology you are using. You are using Mongo. Whoa, <laughs> that's going to be fun. Uh, or you're using something which is tested and you know that it's going to work 
after the day. My colleague here is laughing because <laughs> I was having experience of magically disappearing in the stuff in Mongo. Um, until you, you find how to make it work properly. So you, if you are using some piece of technology which you personally are not familiar with or it's immature technology, and then it's, it's important that you make a focus on that. So going back, uh, going back, you basically zoom in into those aspects, okay, of your architecture which are the highest risk. Just to be sure that you really understand it. You, you, you really don't, can afford not to have the precise understanding of those parts where it's more risky, okay? And this is something that I just found, to be honest, I had never done this exactly in this way. It's something that I've learned preparing this talk. Is this same guy of this software architecture for uh, developer proposed this other way to do this risk? I mean, I, I, I've always done this risk-based um, management of the development and the architecture, the the way I have worked all my life. Uh, basically because I started working with, for banks, so it's, it's important. Uh, but he proposed doing two kind of stuff. One is what he calls the risk storming. Is you basically, with a high level description of your, of your architecture, you start putting sticks, we say, what you think is going to be risky because, for instance, a failure, what's happening if this fails? Or what's happening if you have a, a data inconsistency between these two systems? Or what's happening if uh, this other stuff is becomes compatible because the different versions is something you probably you don't control. Remember the context, that's in context is important because probably you are interacting with something which is control the other team and they can decide to change the technology and you are basically left alone in the dark again. So you need to, for instance, see that this, this is a risk, okay? And then if you, if you perceive this kind of risk, you need to refine your architecture just to isolate those risks, okay? To be sure that if something wrong happens there, you don't expose your whole system to those risks. So this technique of risk storming is something I really like, the idea, because I have been, been doing this in a in more informal way, and I found this is most order way to both find out risk and to document because you can basically attach that to the architecture. And the second one is uh, to capture the, the uh, stakeholder concerns, okay, with another way of risk. It's like what the people who are stakeholders of the systems, uh, what they are concerned, for instance, in terms of cost, time to market, performance, or whatever, okay? And I really love this idea of this diagram uh, you can basically put all the different uh, 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 um, dimensions of, of concerns like security, performance, cost, time, whatever, and then you allow the stakeholder to put their concern there and then to measure and to see, for instance, which here is too crowd. <laughs> I think you have a problem here. Either you have too many uh, stakeholders or people is too ambitious because they want everything of their world reverse everything. But in general, I would think that probably we'll have much less number of these concerns, and you can try to prioritize. And you see, for instance, because you have the difference uh, dimension, you can see is what is more important if uh, 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 performance over price or, you know, reliability over performance or, you know. Uh, supposing you, you, the stakeholders are serious in what they propose, okay? So I really love this idea of making an older way of, uh, of, um, of finding out what are the risks and that will drive the way you uh, architect your system, okay? And regarding the, 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 the actual documentation or, or description of the architecture, another thing that I really like uh, is the idea of this uh, architectural evident code. This is for the other book. Uh, just enough architect, software architecture, is, if you look at there are two examples here, the, 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 this, this uh, package by ledger uh, drawing is basically the way we usually uh, organize our code based on this ledger. We put the services, the API, the services, the business lawyer, or wherever, and that's not the way the code interact, I mean, because usually you deploy a more, more nowadays, and we are moving to this, uh, 
microservice uh, architecture is that you deploy stuff together. So one of the things they propose is that your code should reflect your actual architecture. I mean, there is no, no, no point in making a code that doesn't really reflect it. But this is not that simple as just putting stuff together. It's also the naming. Remember you have a style, and that style have a vocabulary. And from the domain perspective, if you are doing your domain design properly, and you're doing something like domain-driven design, then you have a business vocabulary. And everything in your code should reflect these two realities. So for instance, in our case, the system we work now in a company is an event-driven system. Uh, I have uh, events, I uh, have publisher, I have subscribers. We can also have filters and processors because this is part. And then we have, for instance, um, invoices. So you have an uh, invoice aggregator or invoice filter or invoice uh, publisher or rejected invoice uh, subscriber. You see, it's easy by the name. You're reflecting a lot of stuff, just put in a name. But you don't need a manager. The fuck a manager is. I mean, the, the, I, I know what, whatever kind of class is called whatever manager, I know if we have a problem there. Okay? And actually, you have some a small piece of code over there in the corner, uh, like factory and stuff like that, okay? Because it's boilerplate code, no problem, no risk. But your main code should reflect to bring you back. So as you look at your code, you understand. You, I mean, your code should speak in the same language as your style. If not, why you are using the style? Oh, it's probably because you don't have any. Okay, and actually, that's one of the things that worries me about um, um, this microservice stuff is that probably every team will develop their own language or whatever. At the end, nobody will understand each other because what we're what talking about? What you what you call by a uh, I don't know. A manager, you know, because you don't have a, a compelling, really, a language to speak to each other. I think that's something which will be a, a consequence in two, three years. This, this babel of the languages is problematic, but of, of, of design uh, vocabulary within a company. It's like uh, kind of everybody will, it's like you, you find these people who speak the street language. Yo! It's the same. I mean, you will understand that. I mean, I speak English, guy. What are you speaking? It's the same. People will speak about their system. We say what? Because you will want to start their vocabulary. And uh, as a conclusion, basically, just to summarize, uh, the conclusion is that you know, software development is a pain. It's, 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 if somebody is telling you this easy, it's because it's telling something. And uh, more likely than not, it's selling a framework. And that is. I mean, software is hard. Software has always been hard. Software is going to be hard. Let's accept it. Uh, what we need to do as a community is to increase our knowledge, our capaci capability, or capacity to handle this difficulty by having a stronger design uh, um, knowledge, um, uh, and practicing all designs. And design is something you need to practice every day. You, you cannot simply say, oh, I want design. I'm not a designer. No, you need to keep on designing, facing new problems, new challenges, and learning. And actually, um, I, I think that is something that we need to, to transmit to the new uh, the relation. This happens to me a lot. Because when I hire people, uh, juniors to meet senior people, uh, uh, Java developers. And they start talking about Hibernate and Strauss. Like, Wait, I don't care. Tell me what you know about Java. Okay. Um, uh, actually, um, I used to give them a test, which is a more or less simple uh, web service, one single web service. And they, they give them two trade after the first interview, before the first or the second interview, they get in, and they have three days, one week, I don't care. And the intention is that we discussed. Uh, and the only restriction is you cannot use any framework. You should explain Java. 20% um, of the people don't even show up after that. That's simple as that. And that remembers me that when I uh, started working back in the, the 90, early 90s, there was still a, a, a separation between developers, analysts, and coders. 
the analysts, they basically interview the users and they came up with this nice drawing, the flow diagram, you know? Uh, yes. Hey, I never try a, a, a functional flow diagram, and that should be nice. I will try it at home. Um, with this huge drama of the logic of the stuff that you give it to the coder, and the code is cold. And that is. And we're like machines, you know? That's all the 60s. We, don't, we didn't have EDI, we have coders. You give a, 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 a diamond, they code. They didn't really were able to come up with logic. They did not know about logic. They only were able to translate some requirement to a specific language, say, Kubol, or, or, or whatever, RPG or whatever, okay? And I not to that extent, but most of these junior Java developers are basically Strauss coders. You take up Strauss and they <gasps> analyze how they start doing this. Uh, no idea what should I do first, okay? So that's important. We need to recover uh, this capability from the beginning. And as always, you know, keep calm and let an architect take handle of this problem, guys, because it's software. Thank you very much. Questions? Okay, uh, they, they already did it because I hire them because I, I tell them that they, the, the first day what they will face. No, I mean, there is this uh, 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 other style. Go, go ahead. Yeah, it, it's, uh, it's become natural for them or it's hard to break the, the brain through the See, um, the first, um, Depends a lot of the people, but the, my last experience with very young guy, I mean, this guy was probably three years only working in Java. Actually had some big problem in Java itself. Uh, uh, what kind of, what? But then, uh, as if we have a style, I can basically explain very quickly, just in an afternoon, what was the whole idea of the system. And one of the things that happened is that the rest of the code becomes predictable. Once you know, how something is done, you can more or less predict how other stuff is, is, is going to be solved. Because it's repeated. It's, it's basically the style means find a way to do it and do it again and then again. Even if you find another way to do it, stop it. I mean, try to solve in the same way, be predictable. Don't introduce artifacts or, or side solutions because then people get confused. But if, if you have a style and you are very, um, I would say, um, if you restrict yourself and you're consistent with your style, you can easily explain the style because the style is, is something like simple as pipes. You, how long it takes to explain somebody what a pipe is? It's quite simple. It's not the same that we proficient doing short script or you use, you know, fancy concatenator stuff. That's, that's mastery. But I mean, the basic comes in something you can explain in, in, in half an hour. Okay, you can give them some examples. And once you get there, you start finding that everything is the same. Okay, um, I think that's my experience. Is that basically it's not that difficult. Uh, the nice thing is that I can very quickly find out if this guy know what he's doing, doing or not. <coughs> but when you have a framework, hmm, you will surprise how far people can go without knowing what the heck they are doing, just because the framework brings you, you know, an EDI and whatever. But they didn't know what they're doing. It's like, you know, you, it's like with a child, you take your skateboard and you go downhill and you can't stop anymore, but who cares? <laughs> you feel in control, but you are not anymore. So it's the same. So what, something I like is that the people don't know what it's doing, they can do anything. They will stop. They will say, whoa, I don't know. And then I bring, come in and say, okay, what's going on? Because I usually the, the, the architect of the project. So a, a good side effect is that you can find if people is knowing what they're doing or not, because it, otherwise they're not going to do anything, probably, or will be very evident that they're doing something wrong. Other question? Um, hi. I think, I think you made some very interesting points, which I agree. And one of the questions I had was, you mentioned that some, 
we may come to the place where people speak different languages when it comes to design, which again I agree. I mean, but do you think things like uh, modeling languages like UML can help to mitigate that, or are you talking even more beyond that, more like design patterns, things like that? That doesn't matter what whatever you use. Okay. Um, uh, first, UML is basically a notation, so basically doesn't really give you. It's, it's it's more like a grammar. So you can yeah, you can understand the grammar of English, and you you go back to the street, and people say yo 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 yo, and you say what what's going on? So I'm um, speaking of the of the actual idioms people use to express your, themselves, and the UML probably won't, won't help at all. Um, same way you talk about patterns. Pattern. The problem with pattern is that so uh, low level. Okay, the main difference between an architectural style and a pattern, uh, regardless of what the Wikipedia says, <laughs> because it's plain wrong, is that an architectural pattern is a language about the overall concept of your system. You just keep an example of pipes. They're not really a pattern, it's a vocabulary, how do you express your system, the basic concepts. You usually won't find more than five, four concepts and some restrictions. Patterns are for solving specific problems. There are some intermixes because depending on your architectural style, it's more likely you have some kind of problem and then some patterns are more relevant than others. That's true, but patterns are much more low level and more related to um, design. And just a final comment on this is that design is for solving the problem you have found. Architecture is for solving the problem you haven't even found. It's, be, it's, be, it's about risk and future problems. Once you have a problem, you solve it by design. But the, the, the main objective of having architecture is to be ready for something you didn't even think about. A good architecture should protect you for things. That's why you need the context. That's why you need risk analysis. Just because you need to have a bit understanding of the landscape. And that's your architecture. So pattern is much low level. Um, uh, what do you tell your boss <laughs> when he heard uh, on the street the word spring and whatever and whatever and whatever and we need developers with whatever, 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 whatever that you don't want it? <coughs> how, how can you defend your point to, to these people that only, only hear? And okay, um, that's why hard, I work so hard to be the boss myself <laughs> to avoid this discussion. No, I mean, this last time I had this discussion with this boss, it's, it's, um, it's difficult because there's a pressure uh, from the people around me, uh, consultants stuff that tell them that they should be using Hibernate. I was trying to explain this. Um, I think that is the, the, the the way it works because uh, I, I don't know, I don't have a good answer to this. I'm sorry, but I don't believe there is any good answer because it's people problem. Uh, it's like I, I've already gained uh, some uh, confidence, so he allowed me to do something uh, small, and the guy went um, uh, for vacation, and he when he came back, uh, the system was working. And the first thing he told me was, I was never expecting you to have anything working. Let's say, yes, no. Um, and from this point on, I gained the respect, so to speak, the confidence. But it was hard. Um, hard at the level of firing. Uh, I mean, I don't go into going to George George because you tell me that, or because this guy told me. I mean, I know what I'm doing. And uh, why you hire me is, if you don't believe I'm knowing what I'm doing, those, we, well, we have a problem. Either you be hiring me or, or myself. So what do you do? At that level of the discussion, it was complicated because a lot of people was type saying you should use this, you should use that. Well, I mean, I'm the, the architect. Uh, and it was complicated. So my advice is probably you want to try this at home. Is to start building some confidence by doing something as small, but at the same time it has some impact because it cannot be really a toy. It's something that you say, you see, I can do this, which is tough. We can do it this way, and very important, try to gather the feedback for the team, because the team, that will be important. But what, I mean, I'm not saying you, I, I think you will do better 
better software, but also you will increase the knowledge of the group. And that's something you need to consider and those things you can transmit to your, to your boss. Say, I'm doing this, I'm solving, I'm delivering quality software, and besides this guy, I'm learning. Everybody good? Okay. Well, sometimes uh, the frameworks solve some uh, boilerplate code or oh, some problems, repetitive problems, and if you don't use any framework, uh, how you, sh how you uh, avoid to repeat the code once and again? Well, I mean, in general, is this something you need to do one and again? The best way to do is probably doing some better design in terms of creating subclassing or whatever. Uh, for instance, uh, you're right. Um, uh, I have a problem like this in one system. I have a lot of repeated boilerplate, but at the end, I'm doing some um, um, genetic magic because this is magic. Uh, and then once it works, you, you shouldn't touch it because it's, it's, it will break something. I, I created a, a small framework myself, but framework in the Bola library uh, 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 that allows me to reduce the boilerplate, I would say, the, probably by 30%. But um, at the end, this polyplay code tends to be a very simple one. Um, even with this repeated whatever is predictable, so it's not really a problem for me. It's not, it's, it's, it's volume, but it's not complex. It's, there is, doesn't introduce any complexity. Um, I think you were referring to the principle of uh, dry, don't repeat yourself, which is a major principle. But I think there is a difference between using a framework and using a library, because most of the things, I mean, I oppose really, I see framework skeptical, but libraries are a good thing. And there's a difference. Uh, actually, what I did in this case was creating a library and that make all these more played, but it was tricky because I had to do a lot of genetics and stuff like that to make it work uh, in a more unitary way. It would take me to do a refactoring of the code. At the end, you need to know what you're doing. And that, that, that's the final message. At, at some point, you need to do what you're doing. To, because it was not really easy to do it. Actually, I had to do it myself because the other developers in the team, they understood the problem, but they really don't, they didn't have the, the knowledge to solve it. So I solved with them, and they didn't learn, okay? Uh, and that's something also is important, that they, at the end, they learn more. I mean, uh, as, as, a, as an architect and project manager, uh, Something that really uh, I really appreciate is seeing my developers growing to the point that one of them left the company recently because the company was too small for their ambition. That's, that's, that's beautiful. I feel like happy. I mean, I hired this guy, and three years later, I cannot retain any more because the, the guy knows too much more and was too ambitious what he wants to do that he had to leave the company. Perfect. I mean, that's, that's the idea. Question? Thank you guys for your attention.